I think here's here's a call for you. You can hold me to account for it. Um, important to do that. I think running into next year's election, we're going to see vastly reduced load shedding, probably somewhere between stages zero and stage two. Business community loves Dr. Franz Cronier. Unfortunately, he's so busy that we don't get to talk to him as often as we'd like to, but we have got him now. He is the chairperson of the Social Research Foundation. Last time we had a chat, France, was four months ago. I, I understand that a year is a lifetime in politics, but it feels like the past four months is almost a lifetime as well. At that point in time, you were, you were quite upbeat. Do you still retain that uh, perspective? Um, well, I'll explain it as, as we carry on, but uh, yes, indeed. A heck of a lot's happened in those four months. We've had, I was just thinking about it before the interview, we've had the ANC elective conference, obviously, where Cyril uh, managed to get, Cyril Maposa managed to get re-elected. There's been more trouble with the opposition coalitions in Gauteng. uh, And you you did highlight that many of the, mm, well, disgruntled ANC or other voters saw that as a big problem, that why bother to go to, elsewhere because the opposition parties are just bickering amongst themselves. We've also had the EFF's damp squib shut down uh, and then big gains in by-elections for the IFP. So those are the areas that we've been covering on Biz News over the last little while. But maybe let's just start off at the uh, at, at the crux of what our community is interested in, being primarily the business community, people who invest, people who who are committed to South Africa and want to grow their wealth in the long term. How is the Rainbow Coalition? Yeah, well, let, let me give you a report and some of the numbers, and they'll they'll tell you that. Now, fortuitous that we're talking today, because over the last couple of days, I've got the next batch of polling numbers in. I understand a few things about them. The sample here is about 1,500. Our, our previous sample we shared with you was 3,200. So our margin of error on these numbers, on the national numbers, is about 4%. So my advice to people who hear the numbers, don't cling to a specific figure. Um, rather, read the figures as indicative of trends, and I think they're very good at that. We've got the ANC modeled for turnout, so assuming an actual election, at 52%. That is up marginally from the 49 50% that we had it on about six or eight months ago. The DA has steady at below 25%, by 23, 24. That's largely where it was. These things do fluctuate from through days of the week, but this is where we hit the mat. The EFF is sharply down. You know, it, it was sustaining levels of over 10. It's now down somewhere between 6 and 8%. And uh, the reasons for that is it, it, it hits dead end. It's, it, it's offer of radical populism doesn't have deep and far-reaching appeal. Uh, so it's way down. IFP, you've been reporting on, and your instincts are absolutely right. Way, way up from from 2% plus to 6% on the national uh, figure. Bear in mind margins of error. So again, read the trends. In KZN, absolutely astonishing. Uh, from from uh, uh, somewhere, I can't remember, just north of 10%, 23 is is where it's at at the moment. Huge inroads are eating into the 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 EFF and um, ANC share in that province. The Freedom Front is up uh, from two to around three, which if, if your base was two, three is quite far ahead of that. Um, ASA is down on the raw number that's not yet modelled for turnout from 4.73. Um, chiefly in line with that is that Mr. Mashaba's popularity is way down, about 50% over the last eight months, and that's really the newcomer syndrome. You're new on the scene, very exciting, and then the things kind of moderate after that. On turnout, modeled ASA numbers probably down from five to to around near a four. Um, So that's the, that's the, the, the national picture. An important thing that I actually only saw this morning in the numbers preparing for you is this, that Mr. Ramaphosa's popularity continues to fall. About three, four years ago, when he became ANC leader, his popularity score was in the 60s. Just think of that as a relative measure. And when we tested him about it, it's been falling 
since then. And when we tested him eight months or so ago, he was at 50. We've now got him at 40. But the important thing is this. He continues to fall, but the ANC is stabilized. And that means, perhaps, that ANC support is decoupling from dependency on CR17. A lot of ANC strategists will be very pleased about that. Uh, when, when, he, when he nearly resigned, uh, perhaps momentarily did, uh, late last year, a, a lot of ANC people were very worried because what would come after him. So that decoupling is starting to, to happen. Inside the provinces, I'll give you a little bit of a look. In the Western Cape, the DA is suffering some erosion to parties like Gates and McKenzie's uh, PA and Patricia DeLille's good. That, that we're seeing quite clearly. But when you model the, the Western Cape for turnout, the DA should still be in, in the high 50s or so uh, there at, at this time. In, in KZN, uh, you know what's going to happen to the ANC number, because you've heard the IFP numbers down from about 44, 44.8 to 36%. So sharply down. Now, that's very important because um, it's the fat lady of South African politics. And one of the great risks the ANC faces, it's lost the Western Cape, that's gone. It, I'm going to tell you about Gauteng now, probably also going to lose Gauteng. If it loses Natal, the, 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 the ANC risks a fate of becoming a regionally based, northernly party of sort of Mpumalanga, northwest Limpopo, where it will uh, host eventually its, its, its final conference. In Gauteng, um, about eight months ago, uh, the, the DA was m one point ahead of the ANC. Uh, ANC was at 29, the DA was at 30. They've changed places. ANC's now gone to 34, DA's gone to 26. Key reason for that is a point that you have already made this morning, and that is um, that the coalition have failed to inculcate the reasonable belief that coalition government will definitely be better than ANC government. It hasn't been tremendous. Uh, the coalitions have surrendered the cities they captured in Gauteng to, to a significant extent. The audit result in Chwane, many years into DA governance of that city, was appalling. As bad as anything that will get out of the depths of ANC governed Eastern Cape, uh, you'll remember there was a moment during the coalitions when two power stations were discovered in Pretoria. And that was an absolute gold dust moment because if they'd taken them, commenced the refurbishment of them, the coalition would have had a political platform to say, look, I will solve load shedding. But that deteriorates into accusations of corruption and internal squabbling. So that, that moment was squandered. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, to a point where now, and this is the stuff from yesterday evening, you ask voters the questions: Are coalitions working? Eighteen percent say yes, and seventy percent say no. But that's correct. That's, I mean, it's true. You can't say these things are working. Not not in the South Tech at all. Um, where where does that leave us? Uh, I, I made notes for you. Um, the the ANC gets the scare, it's going to lose. And, you know, the narrative in a lot of the mainstream media was absolutely finished, they below 40%, but all of which, these things are very volatile and they'll fluctuate. So my numbers I'm giving you today are not a forecast of next year, they're where we are now. Cancel change. But under pressure, here I make the case for the ANC, fiscally prudent, still, that budget that the minister did earlier a few weeks ago, absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, we were not trying to print money to create inflation in order to drive up populism, all the kinds of things that would have happened in societies similar to ours where a liberation movement government hit the brink. Fiscally, it's, it's solid. Basic civil rights largely intact. We were not seeing opposition leaders dragged away by the Gestapo in the middle of the night and and. I think there, there's a um, phenomenon, quite somewhat understandable, that people look at our current position, which is dire, and imagine this is the worst thing that could ever happen. This is rock bottom. But it's not. We're not printing money. We're not locking up the opposition, jailing journalists, uh, 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 driving the likes of yourself in, into exile. I think 
broadly the ANC is becoming less populous than it was five years ago. The expropriation idea very much on a back burner. In, inside the ANC, it's well understood that the political benefits from expropriation virtually nil. Uh, the the but but the costs absolutely immense in in how it put the brakes on investment and therefore directly led to deteriorating living standards, which harms the ANC. In in areas open to privatisation, I mean it's a bit of a debate, but on railways, which are on a dire state. You know, there, there, there's some serious consideration to privatising these. Now, the last person to do that was uh, not the last one, but most one of the most recent prominent ones, Margaret Thatcher. And this is the ANC. And on electricity, I've done quite a lot of that since on that since we last spoke. So we'll talk about a bit about that today. I think here's here's a call for you. You can hold me to account for it. Um, it's important to do that. I think running into next year's election, we're going to see vastly reduced load shedding probably somewhere between stages zero and stage two. And uh, if you ask ANC voters, you know, what has load shedding done to your perception of the party? They say it's greatly dented it. We seriously reconsider our support. If you then say, what would happen if the ANC actually did eliminate load shedding? ANC support gets such a boost that conceivably, if you sort of do a bit of a rough estimate, the present 52% could move to... Right, perhaps even somewhere north of 55. How, how's that for a different view to a lot of what you get in the main street? Alec, that's the report. Yeah, completely different to what the by-elections are telling us, though. In the by-elections, we're seeing the ANC lose almost, well, consistently to the EFF and now even more so to the IFP. So, And, and certainly they're way below 50. By-elections are very useful within their limitations, same as polls, within their limitation. And um, you, you, you don't like it with all these things. I mean, skepticism is invited to my own analysis, very good for people. And, and you know, by-elections are little kind of dipsticks into specific communities and often on around narrow, specific issues that triggered that by-election in the first case. Sometimes your turnout figures aren't that high. The useful measures, but not but not necessarily definitive, Alec. It's really interesting to see this, France, because Sir Ramaphosa, for all his faults, has played a long game. And everything that he seems to be putting in place might just, the timing might just come together by the election next year. From what you're saying now, it, it is different, and you are usually ahead of the game as well. So I think many people are going to take this very seriously, uh, that maybe that strategy that the ANC is employing is the correct one. And maybe for all the furore over the departure of Andre de Reta at Eskom, there was some method behind the apparent madness. Well, I don't know if he's played a long game. I think the opposition's played a very short game. Six, eight months ago, opposition's a year ago, beautifully positioned. Uh, confidence in Ramaphosa is collapsing. ANC supporters on a steep downward dive. And they've got this opportunity. The jewel in the crown, these Kauteng cities, take them over, appoint top-class civil servants, and begin the slow process of rebuilding. Had the, you know, it's now, it's now, Theoretical at, the, at this point, I think, given how 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 the poll numbers looked at that point, had the opposition been very successful in in using Gauteng as a blueprint of what the whole country will like, be like in twenty twenty four under a coalition government, we today see the ANC far below fifty percent, and that coalition vote surging. So I think an ANC short game kind of collided with an opposition short game, and voters. And, and all, all that's happened is, is the rate of dissent of ANC support has slowed or stopped, and the rate of increase in opposition support has slowed or stopped. I think that's probably the fairest way of putting it. Um, aided somewhat, the ANC somewhat aided by becoming a bit more pragmatic and and um, and we, we see that we can get into Eskom just now if you want to um, 
Well, well, that is the that's the big story, isn't it? It's all about the second industrial revolution. We're supposedly in the fourth, but the second is electricity, and electricity has it affects every single citizen. If you can't get that right, then you will surely lose power. Excuse the pun, but on the other hand, if you do get it right, maybe as you've mentioned earlier, that is really going to resonate with voters and those who. Have otherwise might have stayed at home or switched alliances, would say, well, let's give these guys another chance. No, no, I think we, we can get it right. Um, over the last couple of months, we did quite a lot of trying to understand energy numbers and how much grid space there is, how many power stations. The more we did of this, the more it just didn't make sense to us that there's load shedding. And and this is why, if I, if I sum it up for you, um, uh, coherent is quite complicated. We, even through February, on average, we generated in a peak hour of the day twenty three or twenty four thousand megawatts. Uh, may, maybe I'm out by a thousand here or there, but roughly. Of that, about sixteen, seventeen thousand came from coal, and then the rest came from everything from the pumped storage stations to the gas turbines that burn diesel to a bit of solar and wind to. Kuberg and, and to imports. So about 16, 17,000 of coal are being produced. But coal infrastructure, the potential generating capacity of coal plant that exists in the country, about 45,000 megawatts. So only a third of that is operating at its, um, at its full potential. And an idea is being cast about uh, behind uh, various scenes, because it's quite controversial and you know, people don't like being attacked and press and that. To say that it's plausible that we refurbish a third of the country's coal infrastructure. Now, how that's explained to me is that you basically go into a coal plant that was built decades ago, but the structure is pretty solid, and you do an audit of the boilers and, and things, and you pull out all the parts that are broken, and you order replacements, and you put them back in, you refit it. It's, it's like a serious service of a car, is how it was put to me. It's perhaps too simple, but that's the point. And it, it should be possible on a timeline of around three years to put one, so one third of the coal fleet's working, two thirds are not, to recommission a further third. The, the impact of that would be uh, sufficient to allow the country to sustain modest rates of growth between 3 and 4% if other policy reforms are brought about. Firstly, it's not just, uh, not only energy. To allow rates of growth again of 3 to 4% of GDP from an energy perspective for a period of 10 years. The, 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 this is not an, an, a, a lot of people get very cross if, if you say we must reinvest in coal and, and, and get coal going again. It, it's not at odds with green transition ideas and the like. Similarly, if you refit the coal fleet sufficiently to firstly eliminate load shedding and then again allow modest growth, we will put the country in a position from an energy perspective to sustain the modest rates of growth necessary to secure our longer-term political stability so that in 20 years' time, when the, the true potential of the green transition is, is, is there, we actually are still a society, a democracy, an economy that cares about things like green and just transitions. So on the 10-year view, it is relatively straightforward to see how to eliminate load shedding and restore growth. The reason for load shedding in the main, I mean, there are plenty of reasons, corruption, incompetence, all of that, but, but a key reason is a far too rapid move away from coal, a far too fast turn away from coal, in, chiefly in the form of not investing enough in the maintenance and refurbishment of the coal fleet. And that needs to be done now. If it is, growth is again in reach. In the 12-month window, let's get to the chart that, that, that deals with that sort of thing, by lifting coal production by two to 3,000 megawatts, uh, by adding, um, uh, by, by buying enough diesel to ensure that the gas turbines are operating at a, at a level higher, closer to their potential than has been the case through the middle of February. So adding a modest amount of solar and wind and, and the refit of Kuburg being completed, 
within 12 months, it is perfectly plausible looking at the data that we will be at load shedding stage zero, perhaps on a bad day stage two, perhaps on a good day, we'll have a bit of surplus to allow growth. So my prediction is within 12 months, we will have, we will be in a better position. There's energy. And if you read that against what I've told you about ANC support and how the ANC becomes a bit more pragmatic and, and how the, the broader opposition coalition disappoints for a period, it can all change again. Um, you, you can see how it's, it's, it must be seriously considered now that the ANC wins the election in 2024, which isn't different to what we've said before on the show, but it's, it's the balance of, of on, on the odds, that's where it's leaning at the moment. Certainly, the, bal the balance of opinion is very different. What, what about players like... Gaten McKenzie on the one hand, who has been flip-flopping and bringing the ANC into power, so put him there, and the guy who thinks that he'd make a good president, Rob Hershoff, whose FTSEC ANC campaign uh, does appeal to quite a large percentage of certainly the white population, but is this a little bit too much in your face? Well, I don't think it's too much in your face. I think it's a valuable part of the spectrum and makes a very important contribution a lot of people are very critical of, of Rob Hersov and if, but if you put it to them, what what about what Rob said is 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 not true? Uh, where, where they can't, there's not, there's nothing there. It's the manner in which he conveys. It. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, you, you know, you can do things in various styles, but you you, you shouldn't be critical of a person who um, takes an aggressive stance on a failing government. I mean, we shouldn't hold. The, the government in such high regard that that we become to be uncomfortable that there is a very outspoken uh, activist on the ground who who says very strong things. But what about the voters? What do the voters think about that? Is that given given the, given South Africans are mainly Christian, mainly uh, conservative? We've we've spoken about this through the period at at the IRR, where you worked a lot with those kind of, that kind of data, would they be offended perhaps by the approach that is being taken there? I think I understand ANC voter opinion. It's just stick just inside the ANC. I think for, from, from the extensive research into ANC voter opinion, I tell you comfortable majority of ANC voters would say Rob Hershoff is 100% correct, completely wrong. So they wouldn't be deeply offended. They, I mean, particularly if, if you're a person that, 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 that's relatively poor, you don't have the luxury of the middle class elites to put up your own water tanks in Johannesburg, uh, solar power on your roof, uh, escape, uh, armed response at the gates, uh, private school, private medical. You, you escape all the consequences of ANC failure. Uh, poorer communities don't. But what, what, what I think has happened in the last six to eight months, is that to, to whatever extent the opposition bet that continued ANC failure is the key gateway to our growth, they've miscalculated. Because I think the ANC is going to fail less severely in, into the immediate future. And then if you, want to beat, if you want to beat the ANC, you actually have to be better than it. Uh, you've, you're going to have to govern better and you're going to have to demonstrate that you're governing better. You know, I, I spoke to, to a chap this morning who's extremely good on, on these things, um, uh, Gareth van Onsel. And, um, you know, Gareth made, made the point that if, if you're that ANC voter and you're, you're considering, you, the, the opposition hasn't convinced you that it's clearly better. I mean, it didn't convince me it's clearly better. I don't know if it's convinced you, but I doubt it. You, you, you're more comfortable in, inside the ANC. The ANC does, within its limits, provide social welfare grants, employment within the civil service, uh, various forms of patronage. Are you, are you really going to leap out of that into, into the broader opposition? Uh, you, you, at, at the very least, you, you will reconsider that prospect and 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 you might for a longer period stand the 
in the in the ANC camp. And and yeah, and, and had the ANC continued to fail at the tremendous rate. Um, lights off for longer and longer, water out, transnet, kaput, um, uh, printing money, uh, reckless uh, spending, uh, all of that, then maybe the opposition would just have seen the sort of organic growth. But um, I, I, it, it hasn't happened. The opposition disappointed and the ANC got a bit better. And therefore, I mean, the, the, the conclusion to draw from all these numbers, and, and again, I just reiterate, don't hang on to a specific figure on a party. Look at the broad trends. The broad trend is that the descent of the ANC has probably slowed or stopped, and the growth of the opposition has probably slowed or stopped. And that's what we see. Franz, uh, I'm sure you read The Economist's uh, an analysis of democracy, but the the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit's report where it looked at the whole world and gave South Africa a very poor score and as a fragile democracy on the basis that our voter turnout is so low. So from everything that you've said right now presumes uh, perhaps where we were. Getting the voter, if the voter turnout does improve, would that have an impact in favour or against ANC continued rule? Well, firstly, I mean, those economist guys are, are fine. But you know, I, well, one thing you, you could add is that political participation takes various forms. The, the long-term trend here, yeah, a decade old at least, is that as voter turnout has fallen, political protest action has risen. So we don't have apathy. We don't have political apathy. We, political actors, voters, individuals, are still in the political theater. They just change the stage on which they act. And voters, the, the broader public, you see it in polling always, are very astute politically of, of things. And, and, and you might say that one of the reasons why voter turn, why ANC support has fallen, remember ANC support 15, 20 years ago, I mean, 2004, that is almost 20 years ago, 70%. We're now at 50. It is way down. The reason it's down is voters are astute and understand that it's not delivering. The reason why there isn't a, a, a surge into the opposition, although they in the relative sense, there's been a lot of opposition growth, is that voters aren't convinced that this is clearly a better alternative for us. So voters make logical and practical choices always, quite well-informed choices and choices that you know ob observers would do well to respect and understand the reasoning behind. And protest is, is one of those. And I think if there were more compelling opposition offerings, you would see uh, vote the protest movement give way to, to the ballot box to a greater extent than it already has. And if the ANC was more compelling in its ability to deliver, you would see the protest movement give way again to rising levels of ANC support. Wonderful summary for us, Franz. Thanks for sharing the latest figures and your insights. Just before we depart, uh, are you still feeling upbeat about South Africa in the longer term? Quite. Um, Look, all, all on, on the present trends, many of these options turn out um, pretty well for us. First point I think to make is is remember what baseline we're working from. It's the, the you might in moments of desperation, all the traffic lights are out, or no water in Johannesburg, no electricity. I think this is absolute rock bottom. But and and but it's not. Um, we remain a, fis a, a, a fiscally prudent. You don't know how grateful one should be. I'm not saying you should be grateful to government, but you don't know how grateful you should be that we do not have a cabinet that are printing money. That would have been absolutely devastating, economically and politically. Um, basic civil rights are perfectly intact. You can form a political party. You can say the president's an idiot if you want to. You can host a conference in the Drakensberg and have, have Rob Hersov there, and no one's going to do anything to you. It's a fundamentally free society. We're fortunate in that respect. Under pressure, and the ANC was under incredible pressure. I mean, this this idea in the, in, in the media that it's certainly going to lose its its behaviour becomes 
moderately more pragmatic, and it actually becomes somewhat more open to, to reform. Should it fail in that regard, and should it default to the destructive behaviors, some of which are still present, but which, which, which characterize the much of its past, immediate past decade, what will then happen is you will see the balance of voting opinion move back to the broader opposition. And that opposition will have a second bite at the cherry to create a plausible case to convince the voting mind that if you put us in power, things will get better very, very quickly. Um, these are our, so, so, so we, we, we and, and from an energy perspective, there's, I, I hear quite a lot, even in business of the lights will never be on again. It's darkness forever. We, I think that's wrong. I think I think people are going to be surprised at at, at what happens on on energy. Um, if this current new minister who said some very he gets ridiculed for saying it, but he's actually said some very sensible things about about the Im, Im, importance of of refitting coal uh, to to put us in a position to remain a stable and free society. I think if you add the totality of these things together. Then um, the conclusion that I reach certainly is that the position in South Africa is much more evenly balanced than um, more negative opinion. I think sometimes suggests or accepts, and that it is perfectly plausible that in in the five to ten year view, this is what I've been articulating for you in these really great chats we've had now over the last year or so. It's perfectly plausible. We have all the assets, all the opportunity, all the systems that are necessary in order to ensure that on that 10-year view, South Africa is a much more successful society than it has been over the past 10 years. I'm, I'm still pretty firmly in that camp, pretty firmly in that camp. Franz Grenier is the chairperson of the Social Research Foundation. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 